Hello, and welcome to another episode of PPC Town Hall. My name is Fred Valles. I'm co-founder and CEO at Optimizer, and I'm your host for PPC Town Hall. So uh, for any of you regular folks who are uh, dialing in, you may see that I am not in my home office. I don't have the Optimizer sign behind me. Uh, I actually have the ocean behind me today. So where am I? Well, you know, I got to the realization that I probably won't have the pleasure of traveling for conferences like I've uh, been so used to doing for another maybe year or so. So I said, I'm just going to book a hotel and I'm going to go there and I'm going to pretend like I'm at a conference and uh, I'm going to do PPC Town Hall from there just to keep things different and exciting because uh, I talk to too many people and they say it's like Groundhog Day. Every day is the same thing. So uh, I am literally across the hill from my house where I live. Um, I, I live in Los Altos. I drove over the mountain towards the Pacific Ocean and found a hotel in Half Moon Bay and uh, that's where I'm coming from. So. Hope all goes well and I uh, hope everyone out there who's listening, uh, you tell us in the comments where you're coming in from and hopefully you're finding ways to, uh, to keep things exciting and fresh uh, in these very strange times. So for PPC, uh, you know, let's not talk about Fred, let's talk about PPC, right? So today we're gonna talk about bid, bid strategies, automated bidding, automation versus manual. We're gonna talk more about the search query changes that Google has recently made. And uh, we have a great speaker to help us with all of those topics. We're going to go a little bit uh, about you know what's happening, what's the philosophy behind it. But we're also going to try to be very tactical and give you very good advice and things you can actually take away. Uh, but yeah, we, we do live in interesting times, and uh, you know, for for anyone paying attention to what's happening outside uh, your doors, I, I think ethics and you know being good and nice marketers and caring about the long term and the good of the world uh, are topics that we might touch on a little bit as well. So here we go. Today we have Nava Hopkins. We're going to talk about bidding. So uh, let's get rolling. All right, and uh, here's Nava. Nava, how's it going? Thanks for coming back on the show. I th thank you as always for having me. I, I forgot about how epic the, the intro music is. It's like the right. best way to start a conversation. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> our spirits uh, right before we get into it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, where are you calling in from today? Uh, so I, I'm in uh, Rhode Island, uh, and when you speak about uh, what we do for interesting times, uh, my my husband is a, is, a, is an amazing artist, and so he uh, created this very zen office uh, space for me. So I'm 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 sitting in my office, uh, sitting with my pup next to me, and all all is well. Very nice. Well, good to have you on the show again. Um, we looked honestly for a long time for someone who I thought could hold their ground uh, with you as a panelist when we talk about bidding, um, and who's got the tactical experience as well as the philosophy. And I had a hard time finding someone. Uh, I mean, there are definitely a number of people, but a lot of them just couldn't make it today. So I brought in um, someone else who definitely knows a lot about Bitmap. Um, so Gitanjali Tiagi, she's one of the co-founders at Optimizer and uh, talks to a lot of our customers about what they're doing for bidding. We think about bidding a lot. So welcome to the show, Gitanjali. Hi, thanks, Fred. It's good to be back. And I hope I can hold my ground with um, I, I like that you're 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 buttering me up just just so that it's like oh we'll agree with every everything that optimizer has to say. <laughs> yeah, I know maybe it's an unfair fight, you know, here with two optimizers. Um, and you I was actually thinking after the last session you did that I should bring my boxing gloves to this one. Um, <laughs> well, we can be a little bit more civil than I guess uh, other other debates, I guess. That's right. I won't talk over you too much. <laughs> Um, they're looking at myself. I mean, there's a shade of like orange there that I am not quite fond of. Oh, don't, yeah. don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's, that's, you're not being kind enough to yourself. You, you do not paint yourself in, in that light. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, definitely no need for boxing clubs. Um, all right. So anyone who's watching, we have the comment and the chat section on YouTube and Facebook. That's a great place to go and put in, uh, just a hello or ask any questions as we get into the topics here a little bit more. But uh, but yeah, let's jump into the first thing that is still top of mind for everyone. So that's the search terms 
uh, reports, changes that Google has made. So, Nava, you work in a fairly expensive industry, right? Like, what does this all mean for you? Uh, sure. So, uh, as uh, you indicated, uh, I work with a lot of lawyers uh, where the average cost per click can be anywhere from $50 to $500, $900. So, when, when the search terms report initially was announced it was being depreciated, my response was, eh, whatever, this will be fine. Um, because ultimately, you're still going to be able to uh, see the the click data or the, the keyword data, um, what your ROAS is. It's not like you're getting less clicks. You're just not getting that transparency on the queries. Um, what I struggle with and where I, I, I've actually switched camps from eh, whatever, Google's being Google, to this is actually a problem, uh, is that there's actually been uh, a fairly consistent underspending issue um, and and not being able to see where queries uh, and where budget is being uh, funneled is 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 really a problem. Um, combine that with um, we. Wait, and then and let's, let's pause. It. I want to go deeper on that. So you're saying you're actually not able to spend enough money. So in in certain. By the way, what what vertical are you in? Just so people know. In legal. Um, legal. So this okay, so, so I have I have a theory. This is the, this is purely theory. So uh, I think this is what's happening. Um, I don't know if this was happening. This is I'm putting this out there as, as opinion. Um, with the launch of local service ads, um, a lot of lawyers jumped on that very quickly. And so there's a lot of spend that would have otherwise gone to paid search, um, paid display, that now is being funneled to local service ads. Local service ads come in at a dramatic discount uh, to traditional paid search. And because Google did away with the uh, requirement that you have to run paid search alongside local service ads, uh, the thousands of dollars that you might spend each day or each month, depending on the size of, of your uh, firm, you now could get away with spending a fraction of that on local service ads. So part of it is, I, be I believe, um, just genuinely people are, are, are not being forced to bid against each other nearly as much or like spend is, is being reappropriated to local service ads. But there's another piece, um, and this kind of alludes to the, the other part of our discussion with automation, the different automated bidding strategies are either underperforming or overperforming um, or overspending. So that's that's where I, I struggle with with the search terms is that we don't have that transparency in underspending or overspending, which is I'm assuming where right. you are going to go. Well, let's, okay, so a lot of stuff here to unpack, I think, right? So. Let's talk about those local service ads a little bit more. So the way that I remember those, I was like, if you're a plumber, a painter, no. So, uh, Educate me. In, 20, in 2019, it, it rolled out to quite a number of professional services, mm -hmm. um, but Google still held them back. Uh, in mid Q2 uh, of this year, really close to the end of Q2, uh, Google rolled it out to, to pretty much every legal vertical that you could imagine, um, CPAs, accountants, things like that. Um, introducing a, diff a difference between say uh, Google Guaranteed where they'll back you for $2,000 if it goes wrong versus um, Google Screened uh, where they won't necessarily uh, cover the $2,000 if it goes wrong, but they're, it, it's a Google guarantee. You, you went through a background check, you have the right re review, star, what have you. The reason why I, I suspect that this is part of the reason why spend has been low is that I have a client that normally spends anywhere between $150,000, $200,000 a month um, on leads. On local service ads, they actually got double the amount of calls and spent $2,500 for the month of September on these. Wow. And it's like... A, why why would you spend money on paid search if you could do this? Right. But Where the other that? is that the spends are are fluctuating, so you have a lot of people kind of testing and pulling budgets back. So, but that's just in the verticals where local service ads impact. Right, and these local service ads, and again, forgive my ignorance on this, but sure. they are on the same search results pages, I, right? I, I feel like we falsely advertise this, and this is turning into a, a local um, town hall, but it, I, I do think it feeds into the bidding. So local service ads serve on desktops, tablets, um, mobile devices, um, as boxes with the name of the company, the reviews, um, and they're mostly focused around generating phone calls. They can be focused around generating messages. 
Um, what's interesting about them is that they also have a voice search component. So if you say, hey, Google, um, I need uh, a plumber, I need a lawyer, what have you, um, the number one result uh, in local service ads will serve as the one result for voice search where you get three on a traditional search result page. They serve above traditional expanded text ads. So the way the SERP now looks, you'd have your local service ads, then you have your uh, expanded text ads or responsive search ads, depending. Um, then you might have local search ads that sponsored Google My Business listing in the map pack. So in, in the local space, I actually think some of the bidding issues, some of the spend issues are specifically because everyone's rushing to try this thing that is right. a hell of an experience to get through. Well, I, have, I, I have never been more upset at Google me. over this, like the, 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 how unorganized they are about this process. Yeah. Well, and an interesting point that you bring up, right? So are we bait and switching here on this topic? And we said it'd be about bidding and now we're talking about local service ads. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's really important to understand like bidding doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like you're it's bidding true. for something, you're bidding in a competitive field and if the competition or the good way Google's products work changes and that changes the comp competitive landscape, then yeah, obviously bidding is impacted by that. And that's what I find so curious when, you know, oftentimes a, a customer of ours will come to us and say, well, Google does automated bidding. Like, why do I still need a tool? Like, what do, what do I do? And it's like, well, yeah, bidding is one thing, right? But it's half of the equation for ad rank. The other half is about quality score. And how do you get better quality score? And you've written some articles that we'll talk about in a bit here, but how do you boost your CTR? How do you boost your relevance? Um, okay, and part of that is ad text. And so how do you optimize your ad text? And then, okay, now you're running on an exact match keyword, which stopped being exact match a long time ago because of close variant. Uh, I, I'm... <laughs> I feel I feel like 2020 is the year where all of my past opinions have come back to bite me. Like like the, my my main pitch that I've been putting into all the conferences is we don't know anything anymore. None of what we thought was true is true anymore. Just keep testing. Exactly. Just keep testing. How do you feel about, <laughs> how do you feel about Skag these days? Um so funny enough, um I still am. I, I still am very much th firmly in the in the stag versus skag camp or single theme ad group versus single keyword ad group. Um, but I've been pushing far more uh, broad match skag um, ad groups and campaigns, especially um, with how much the match types have changed. Um, so one, I, I don't know if if you've seen this. I'm actually really curious because you have access to far more data than I do these days. Um, the the allocation of budget to broad match and exact match keywords mm -hmm. seems much higher than phrase match keywords. So where I used to be all in on do most of your keywords on phrase match, then you have your proven ones on exact, and then you'd have like a random broad match skag. Mm -hmm. Now I'm finding I might have that one broad match skag and then three or four exact match keywords and maybe one mod broad. Yeah. Like that, that's where, I, where I'm at. I'll tell you what I think. Kitanjali, uh, any thoughts from you on that one? You see what you uh, So I think uh, with the whole match types changing, uh, with all the close variants coming in, so people who swear by single keyword ad groups, I think they're still not completely letting go. But uh, it does change the whole concept. Of, and now I think with the whole search terms change, the whole alpha beta structure where you mine your keywords using your broad match keywords and then move them into exact, I don't know how well that is going to work anymore because you probably don't know all the search queries that are coming in with your um, broad match uh, keywords, whether it's SCAG or so one. One thing I've I found very interesting, and this is another reason why the search terms report um, being nerfed a bit is is a problem, is that I've I've always made my decisions on accounts and strategically allocated match types. And I'm I'm curious what you because you guys again the the optimizer database is is, is fantastic. Um, the 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 choice to use a match type, the choice to use a keyword, was entirely dependent on what I would see coming back in the search terms. Did it match by the rules of exact? exact close variant, did it match by the rules of broad or broad 
uh, or phrase or phrase close variant, like what, how was it matching? And the fact that we no longer have that visibility truly is, is a bit of a problem. So um, part of where my strategies have shifted um, on match types and, and SCAGs is I, I still believe and I still see in, in, cur in current account performances that STAGs as in groupings of keywords seem to perform better than SCAGs just in terms of delivery. Um, but in terms of match types, um, I very much am pulling away from phrase match, um, particularly not just for, for how it's matching, but also I'm seeing that those phrase match keywords are actually getting caught quite a bit more often in the, um, the duplicate keyword deliver, delivery problem. So you know how you'll get this alert of, oh, there was a better keyword that, that could match, but it, it, it you pause their phrase match keywords and then magically it's fine. Um, so I don't know, I, I feel like phrase match is, is just becoming a dodo. I think you're muted, which is really unfortunate because I'm, I'm counting on a counterpoint. <laughs> okay, there you go. You got your bingo thing again. Fred was muted again when he was speaking. Um, but no, I mean, I think you're right about the so counterpoint. Okay, well, I agree with you, but I, I think what part of where it stems from is that match types no longer mean what they used to mean, right? And so you're talking about you can no longer see how they match to an actual query. But even aside from that, just the uh, loosening of all the match types, basically, I think most people cannot figure out what a phrase match achieves that another match type really wouldn't. Um, and I know I wrote an article about it, so we can put it in the show notes, but it was so long ago. And I can't even remember. I mean, and basically what we did was exactly what you suggested. We went to the optimizer database and we just started pulling what Google considered to be um, phrase match variants and broad match variants and even exact match close variants for a certain keyword to try to shed light on what does a phrase match actually mean. And, and so historically for people maybe who haven't been doing PPC quite as long, but a phrase match was supposed to mean that the words that you had between your quotes were supposed to stay together. But that doesn't actually work anymore, right? So then what is the purpose of you doing phrase as a what's the benefit of phrase over broad even? Um, when everything is basically going down the path of close variance. And that and that's the thing why I think people have just kind of given up because they don't really know how to tweak it. Now that said, I also know that historically with broad match modified, broad match modified is the one where you put the plus in front of the word that you do not want Google to change. But when Google introduced that, the number of, and I was still working at Google at the time, but the number of advertisers I saw who would just literally put a plus in front of every single word was like mind blowing. It was like, people, this is not what this is meant to do. It's like meant to give you some limitations on how broad things get matched, right? So if you are, um, if you do Hawaiian vacations, but you only have condos on Maui. OK, so you don't want Google to take the word Maui and change it to Hawaii because that's kind of broader. That's not exactly your location. You could put a plus in front of Maui, but in, the, in front of the word of vacations or condos, like it doesn't really matter because if people are looking for a condo or a townhouse or a vacation, like that's kind of all the same thing. So long as it's in Maui, that's something we can service. Right. So that was the whole purpose of it. Put your plus in front of the word. That's so critical to what the user is looking for that if you change it, it really changes your likelihood of being able to close that sale. And so people put pluses in front of every step they misuse it. And, and I think, sadly, to some degree, advertisers are causing all of these reactions from Google that take us further down this path of like, hidden data, more stuff automated, less control over it. Because even when they do give us a control, um, you know, remember there's millions of advertisers and the three of us on this call and the, and the people listening, we get it. We want to be better, right? But for each one of us, there's probably 10,000 who just don't understand and who are going to do it wrong and make Google go down that path. So one one thing um, you mentioned about how we, we typically break things. Um, I, I, I think a lot about aversions to... Um, responsive search ads and responsive display ads um, and the idea of, of auto adding things into accounts. Um, and they're in net new accounts, 
and I've, I've seen this because I've, I've had to create some new accounts uh, for folks. You don't even get the option to, to do an expanded text ad. It's just write a good ad. Right. And write, 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 good, write good group, assets yeah. and, and, and group things together. And where, where I suspect folks struggle is the idea that it should be a partnership. Um, and how much is it a partnership versus is it just here, Google, here's my money. So going part of the reason I brought up local service ads, I see local service ads as the evolution where we don't actually need to think about marketing anymore. It's just here's money, here's targets, go, go have fun. Um, on the on the river on the other side of the coin is the strategy piece of creative and persona mapping and, and all of that. So it's I'm 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 torn here because people need some degree of control, particularly if they they have lower budgets. Mm -hmm. um, like when you have a higher budget, it's you can deal with a little bit of that variation. It's sorry, go ahead. Well, that's no, I mean, you're, you're going deeper on that point, but I was going to say, well, what do you mean by lower spend? And, and, and I think that's a really important point, right? Yeah. So, so the, because if, if you have, say, 5000 or less per month to spend, which I, I do see as low spend for paid for paid search, a um, 1000 per month or less is, is obviously the lowest that, that we're looking at, but say 5000 per month um, on ad spend, you're not going to have the wiggle room to A-B test really. Like you're not gonna have the, the room to um, prove out what variant is the right way of, of, of uh, uh, who's gonna correspond to, to your best prospects. You're not gonna have the, the wiggle room for, for creative. It's gonna be, I just need as many leads as possible because I need a positive ROA so I can keep getting budget. Um, so it's, I, I don't know whether it's a bad thing that control is being taken away from folks that have small budgets. It's the larger budgets where it's more of the problem because there's that, that is where there is the wiggle room for, for um, AB testing. There is that wiggle room for, for all of that. Right. And do, um, your point is that if you're getting 150,000 a month, you're willing to say like, listen, I've got a thousand or wiggle room experimentation budget. That I want to like time. test creative. I want to test like this way of searching. Like, right. Whereas because the premise is that with that ten thousand dollars you put in now, you're actually gonna get to an efficiency that down the line is gonna pay off way more than that. Than exactly. That right. And so for the small for smaller folks, do they need that level of control? I don't know. Like, do they do do they need to engage an agency, um, or could they just hand the money over to Google? I I, I don't know what the answer is. Well, no, and I think that's interesting too because when we look at smart shopping campaigns, yeah, I think they're a great addition in a way for agencies who are now able to bring in smaller clients. And, and thinking about the pandemic, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of businesses that have to shift more and more online because they can't have people coming into their storefront or they're at 10% capacity of what they're allowed to have in, inside, right? So you, you gotta go virtual. But those are typically the businesses that are struggling now, so they don't have huge budgets, um, right? But they also know they need to rebuild business. They need to promote the new way of, of doing business. Um, and so for them, something like a smart shopping campaign or even a smart campaign is kind of, it's, it's better than nothing, right? Like it is honestly not that bad if your alternative is to have no online ads and no new customers. And so even for an agency, now you may have some of these. Sorry, Siri keeps listening to me for some reason. Um, but so for uh, for an agency, maybe you've been working with a client and they haven't really done shopping ads and all of a sudden smart shopping campaigns are a possibility for you. And now it enables you to actually sell that service that you know, that type of advertising without having to have that deep expertise because there's not so much to manage. And it's more a question of setting it up correctly, maybe having the right target row asses for different smart shopping campaigns, and then letting Google's automation do a lot of the heavy lifting and you periodically checking in and then maybe making some strategic shifts in it. But you don't have to be in it day, day in, day out to keep it healthy. Correct. Um, and that that's, I, I, th I think we agree I'm fairly certain we agree um, that bidding is one of those tactics that that you should just delegate out. Like there is no good reason 
to do true manual bidding. There might be though, um, and we talked about this on the last uh, town hall, um, manual bidding when Google is having its, its various issues can be a way to ensure that it bids enough, but you still can have a rule run, you can have a script run, you can use an amazing tool like Optimizer. Um, but like it's, that's, I, I do think delegating out bidding is important. Because if you're sitting there manually changing bids day in, day out, there's there's so much better use of your time. Um, but there is something to be said for using manual bidding and creating your own automation versus trusting in the native automations, which I think is the larger point, is how much are we trusting in um, max conversions, max clicks, target ROAS, target CPA, and even native audiences versus custom audiences, um, and then things like that. So let's talk about native audiences and uh, custom audiences for a minute. So what do you mean, um, well, custom audiences, right? Basically, you you define your own likely prospect, what they might search for, what websites they may have been on. Um, so Correct. to what degree do you leverage that? Uh, so we, we do it quite a bit. Um, granted, again, I, I, Hennessy Digital happens to serve a lot of uh, lawyers. so. Um, the amount of uh, native audiences that are available uh, from platforms are, are, are fairly uh, limited um, because it, it starts to infringe on um, it's too personal. Um, or it, but we will actually do um, quite a, a lot of tactics on display and YouTube campaigns uh, where we'll we'll target folks who are in market um, for auto collision or auto repair. Um, and that that I I do actually I like pairing that native or that native audience with then the custom audience um, insights and then this is the plug I'll I'll give to kind of everybody um, use analytics audiences um, and import in um, those segments because you can basically curate from all of your other channels um, the ideal audience that's not bound by uh, what one native channel is willing to do. Um, Nice, I like that. So you're going beyond the walled garden of the Google ecosystem by basically using Google Analytics to pull in what people have done broadly on the and and so when, when actually when you use analytics, like do you get insights from Facebook what people do on Facebook because that is right. such a closed system that it's hard to it, even look within that, right? Right, but you're able to build effectively a remarketing list off of the behaviors that people did on Facebook, port that over on, onto your landing page, port that over on, onto your uh, organic experience, and then pull that segment over and, and apply it uh, to Google. Um, and I, I love get analytics too, because whenever I look at it, it just seems to have more power in terms of crafting like that niche audience and even like, okay, somebody was on this page for five minutes and then that page for 30 seconds and then they went here and then they played that video. And it's like, you can get really crazy with the type of uh, way that you define the ideal audience. Um, um, but the other thing is the goals. I actually find that, and this is especially true for folks that have to balance SEO and PPC. If you use analytics goals as your conversion actions, um, you're really able to have a solid um, conversion path and you're able to paint a true attribution story. Um, so one of the, the my greatest uh, pet peeves, and I see a, a really good question. Um, so I don't know if we want to address it or, or not, but I, I want to finish this, this one uh, point. Um, one, one of the, the very common issues that comes up in lead gen um, is the question of attribution. Analytics is by default last click. So unless you apply the model and, and you, you kind of look at how uh, the, the, the story weaves, you're going to almost always see from an analytics view organic as the winner, the main driver of conversions. But that ignores how social might have played in, in the path. It ignores how your, your paid media might have played it in, in the path. So by syncing in that analytics goal, you're able to see um, how that goal plays out in all of your different channels, not just um, in analytics. In, in, in analytics. Um, do we want to address the software question or no? Oh, the anti-fraud software? Yeah. Yeah, let's talk to Dan. I mean, Dan's a loyal listener from uh, Tel Aviv, so we should, we should answer his Hello. question. 
Uh, that's that's all the Hebrew you're, you're getting from me, sadly. Um, I wish I had more Hebrew. Um, no, nah, I I um, and I don't know how you feel about this um, because you basically turned your knowledge into a software. Um, a lot of the anti-fraud uh, fraud softwares are basically scripts that you could do. You're, you're throwing money at the problem that you could do yourself. So like, for example, Clixies, I actually like Clixies. I think Clixies is great. Um, but it's basically doing the function of pulling IPs and just blocking them. Um, right. And then at, at some level, I think software and even optimizer, right? I mean, I don't want to undermine optimizer here in any way, but listen, if you had a tremendous amount of time and tremendous drive and dedication, you could do a lot of the, the things that we do as well. I mean, you just pull 15 reports and a couple of gigabytes of data, and then you run them through some filters and like you, you write a few scripts, like it's doable, right? But the reason that people hire software is because it's an efficiency, right? So we, we kind of look at best practices and we, deploy the technology for those so that anyone can more affordably get access to that. And as we know, Google changes very frequently. So just keeping up with those changes, like, yeah, you need an engineering team that's staffing that. As an agency, maybe you could have better dedicated to talking to your clients or thinking about marketing as opposed to technology. Um, right. Where, where I'm not a fan of technology is when they basically take exactly what you could do in the engine and they just put a different skin on it. And then they, they're really flashy and they sell it that way. That I hate. I mean, there's no reason people should pay for that. Um, but so your point is that to some degree, you should be doing these functions yourself. But, but how much time goes into pulling the IPs? And my, my point is that... So my point was that do you want to throw your time or your money at it? Um, so it... The, that that was the the punchline is that if you don't have the time and and resources, throw well, the fifty, two hundred, eight hundred, a thousand, whatever it is per month at the software because they are going to unlock that much more time in your day to do something that you are infinitely better at in in your time based off of your hourly rate that you should know is. Uh, Sorry. And that's, that's a great like way to sum it up, right? But, but I think the other point then that we should ask, and based on what you're saying, um, how much does the problem change versus this is a problem that's fairly well and narrowly defined, doesn't really change that often. And so now yeah. if you're looking at $800 per month to put a solution in place, um, well, maybe it would have cost you 10000 to build that solution one time, and it would have actually been okay for the next two, three years. Right, so then it's the, the value of time plays into that as well. We um we at Hennessy do a lot of our own internal products. We we buy very we we invest in very few softwares. Um, we're very blessed in in our engineering team, um, but the few softwares that we invest in um, are almost always um, attribution conversion tracking related. So like a call tracking metrics. Um, cause we're not going to develop our own call tracking solution. Um, but the other ones are actually where the APIs are very frustrating to work with. Um, so for example, Facebook, Twitter, so on and so forth. Um, we, we will leverage, uh, tools on, on that front. Um, I realized that we didn't really get into, and I, I and since we're on the subject of tools, we didn't get necessarily get as much into how do you deal with search terms getting nerfed. Um, one of the ways I've been coping, um, and I'll, I'll give this plug, uh, Keywords Everywhere is the best plugin I've ever found. And yes, it's like $10 for a million credits. It is the best money you'll ever spend because what you basically can start to do is you can see um, volume for the different variants and auction price estimates. It'll also give you that recommended list of queries. So um, in terms of a cheap solution, to bypass how terrible search terms now is. Um, I heartily recommend that um, in combination with using ad preview diagnosis to get a sense of who is uh, on, on your SERPs. Um, are they the right competitors, so on and so forth. Interesting, keywords everywhere. Keywords everywhere. It's my, uh, I, 
I use it. I make my team use it. Um, whenever we're consulting uh, with our clients and their in-house teams, I make them use it. It's 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 a really good sanity check on what kind of queries could have reasonably resulted um, from the auction prices that our keywords uh, pulled. Um, and they have a lot of really nice exportable reports as well. Nice. Um... Yeah, and things that go through Zapier or that let you put data in between systems is always a good one. Yes. Um, all right, so Dave, thanks for asking your question. It's not even a question. I think you're making a statement here, and it uh, it's a pretty good. It's it's a really good one. Not a pretty good one. It's a really good one. So uh, Dave is saying that the biggest problem with all these automated bidding systems is that when you get junk conversions. And yet you're still calling those quote unquote conversions, then the Google system thinks they're doing a fantastic job. They keep a fantastic job of giving you more junk that you're not paying for, right? So uh super, um, super point. What do you do about this? You don't count them in conversions. How? Like don't and don't use smart and don't use smart bidding if you don't trust your conversion. So there's there's two things. One, in your conversion settings, you can tell Google whether to count it in conversions or not. Um, where it will actually speak to TCPA or TROS or, or all of that. The other thing is if you don't trust your conversions, don't use smart bidding. <laughs> Just don't. Um, uh, I, I, I feel like a broken record on that one because I've, I've been... Well, you, so, so, sorry, you were talking about call tracking software, right? So I think that's one piece of the equation. But uh, I, I think the problem is if you put your conversion at the level of somebody just filled out the form and like, that's it. But how do you track beyond that? How do you get to the quality of the conversion? Uh, got it. So one is you have to actually have um, an infrastructure in place that can track the lead through. Um, Pardot is a, is a great way of doing it. Um, uh, UTM parameters to, to track the lead also in analytics, see what the user journey is. Um, I think we talked about last time uploading business data. Um, we can give a shout out to that again. Um, a lot of it comes down to the client being good about their intake. Um, so we act, act, before we got on this call, uh, I actually had a discussion with a client where we've driven them leads. We've a thousand percent driven them leads. We actually invested some time in doing an audit of all of their leads uh, to, to and not leads, cases rather. Um, I apologize, we've de definitively driven them leads. They, they were questioning whether we've driven them cases. And we actually went through all the information and showed them definitively, here are cases that you've gotten from these leads. Um, and they, they still were questioning it. So part of it is having that, that open conversation with clients and helping them build infrastructure so that they can report and they can have that intake system internally. The other part is is doing the legwork yourself and having tools like call tracking metrics, um, having form fills go to you so that you can kind of check those leads and see lead quality, um, things like that. Makes sense. Uh, I uh, I wanted to quickly add a point to, uh, to what Nava said earlier. So it's be, especially if you're using smart bidding, it's really important to send the right data into the system. And I also think having the right, right level of attribution because I've come across some customers who are using completely automated bidding uh, strategies from Google and they're running on last click attribution. So the system is automatically cutting the queries that would drive top of the funnel conversions and then they're wondering why it's not working. So uh, also going back to the point about delegating your bidding, but you need to know exactly which part of the process you're delegating. So you, it's, you still have to set the right targets. You still have to have the right attribution models. That's the part you can't delegate to Google because if you don't give the system the right data, the system is they're machines after all, so they can't make the right decisions. Yeah, and that's a fantastic that's point. And I mean, I see that as a problem that uh, as newer PPC managers come in who've never done manual bid management, they may not understand what it really means to manage a bid and how the auction works. And uh, and so then they're like, oh, cool, well, Google says it's automated bidding and all I have to do is put in a target, but then they forget that, hey, maybe that target actually depends on your margins shifting and your 
vendor relationship relationships changing and your promotion calendar that's changing pricing right and all of these things weigh into it and so <laughs> when i have the pleasure of going on stage for an audience i'm like guys when you all were putting in bids cpc bids like you didn't put in one bid and then walked away and figured it was done right but for some reason people tend to believe that you put in a bid or a target for tcpa or t roas and then you walk away and that's okay and that's it's like no that's not okay google is automating the conversion between what the expected conversion rate is and what you're trying to achieve in terms of cpa and then putting the bid into the auction but it doesn't look at anything to do with your business. It doesn't necessarily know all the things that you know about your business, um, right? I mean, and so for someone like Nava, that probably means how busy is your law firm, right? Do you want to take more leads? Like, are you desperate for more work? In which case, you're probably willing to spend a lot more to get those new leads. Whereas if you're like, wow, we're pretty busy, but if it's a huge uh, case, then maybe that one will take, right? So your priority shift, and that should be reflected in your targets. So it it's not just that um, it's the quality of lead and, and accepting accepted leads versus uh, rejected leads and why they get rejected. Um, one thing I've actually found I don't know if if you're seeing as much in new advertisers is um, a penchant for leaving search partners on and getting conversions, but then the conversions are just atrociously terrible. Um, and then they'll they'll take off search partners and they're like, oh, I ca I can't believe I took off search partners. My conversions dropped. Um, like there's <laughs> this short-term memory of yeah. my leads were terrible. I was throwing all of them out, but then quality improves. Uh, volume goes down, but quality improves. Did, is your ROAS better or, or not? Um, and one I think thing if you're in-house, it's great because you understand, like you can actually look yeah. at where your business is evolving. But as an agency, there's the risk that you have that disconnect between what actually shows up on the bottom line in the bank account of that customer. So we what we do, um, we make sure every quarter there's a kind of a buy-in and we, we ask all these these main core questions of how many leads are you getting each month? Where could that number grow to? Um, how much do you make per ser service vertical? Um, and has there been any shift? Are there any changes coming up this quarter that we need to be aware of? Um, so for, uh, uh, for example, if your intake team is so behind that there are thousands of leads that are just not being touched, I am ethically compromised to keep encouraging you to spend money. Like I, I can't spend dollars if you aren't following up on your leads. Um, not because you don't want to, but because you're so behind because there are so many. Um, so it's just, it's having right. that transparency. Well, th there's that. And then I, I've talked to customers and they say that, listen, we've done a fantastic job driving the leads and uh, Sorry, I don't, uh, I think I cut out. So you've done a fantastic job driving leads and phone call, but then the person who picks up the phone is not one of your experienced lawyers. It's like a 16 year old high school kid with no experience who you're paying minimum wage. Maybe it's your son who's picking up the phone, doesn't really know anything about law, you never coached the kid on how to properly like be polite, how to take the lead. And then you're like, well, you know, why am I spending hundreds of dollars on this and I'm getting no new clients? And it's like, it's not PPC that's necessarily broken. It's who's answering the phone and how you're following up or, or even the voicemail message that's that people hear when they call in, right? And so I assume that's much less of a problem with the level of clients that you're talking about when you're spending 150 grand a month on legal leads. Um, but if you're uh, that smaller lawyer and just starting to dabble with PPC, like that is a pretty serious risk that you just forget there's more to the big picture than just the lead chat. It's very true. And it, I think it leads into this question very nicely about the, the geo-modifying ideas. Um, I'm assuming that's a question that we're, we're going to pick up. Yeah, please. Um, so so one, let's frame the question. We, we do put this out as a podcast. So uh, uh, we're asking here if it makes sense to add geo keywords like divorce lawyer Minneapolis MN versus just putting in the keyword divorce lawyer? Uh, so I've found that from a volume standpoint, the volume is almost always on that divorce lawyer or uh, div divorce firm, divorce family law, what have you. Um, but quality score and sometimes quality of lead, particularly um, 
ironically enough, desktop leads are better on those, those geo-modified terms. Um, I will typically add a divorce lawyer, Minneapolis, and then ironically, when we talked earlier enough, uh, or we talked earlier about broad match SCAG, that would be the one I would do as my SCAG um, because there's enough terms in there to ground the broad match keyword. And then I would have every other keyword I'm actively targeting as a negative in that ad group. Um, so that I'm protecting my my Sorry, back specific up. ideas. I want to make sure everyone really gets this. So which one would you put as the SCAG? So the broad match SCAG would be divorce lawyer Minneapolis MN because there's enough terms in that keyword to ground the broad match in what we actually want it to do. And because we've added every other keyword we're actively targeting as an exact match negative into that ad group, we're able to protect our general service terms, the ones that we actually are expecting to perform. And then that SCAG is able to do that data acquisition is able to secure those additional leads grounded by that geo-modified um, service term. Right, and because it's grounded by the geo modifier, you actually know exactly what to put in the ad because the user very specifically said that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that makes sense. You get higher quality score, so higher quality score means a little bit less CPC that you have to pay to maintain your rank. Usually, I I I, I like that you're leaving the door open for me to be like, well, quality score. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, <laughs> Nah, I've, I've, I don't know. I, I, I go back to what I said earlier. Um, I, I feel like this is the year where all of us eat a slice of humble pie and just admit we don't know what we know. Um, we're always testing, and quality score could be the next messiah in 2021. It could also continue to fade into irrelevancy. I don't know. Um, it is. Right, and so okay, here we can have a little boxing match now. So, <laughs> okay. I mean, the, the point is, I, I kind of agree that it's being paid less and less attention to. People talk about it less, but it doesn't take away from the fundamental point that Google makes money on a cost per impression basis, right? So they 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 want to monetize the volume of searches they have at the highest level possible. Yet they've always held that they want to as advertisers to pay on a cost per click basis. And these two things, they don't mesh, right? So if someone has an ad and they're saying, yeah, sure, I'll pay you $1,000 for a click, but nobody ever clicks, they make no money, right? So the thing that keeps that in balance with the real goal of monetizing search results pages is that not only do you have to put in a high bid, but you also have to draw a decent number of clicks. And so that over time was called that was called CTR, and then it became called quality score. So even if we're paying less attention to it, that is still a really core part of the auction um, and something to pay attention to. And, and so that's why I think like just going in and setting a bid or setting a target and then forgetting about ad text optimization and finding better keywords um, and just and having a better offer, having a better landing page, having a better sales process, like all of these things help you be able to set a bid that actually makes sense for your business. And so that, I mean, let, let me turn this full, full circle sure. for a second to sure. search terms, right? So um, people are concerned that Google showing us on search terms that make absolutely no sense for our business. And I'm going to be controversial here, but I'm going to say there's no such thing as a bad search term. The only thing that makes a search term bad is that we pay too much for it, right? And, and so in many cases, one penny is still too much, right? And then we wish we could get rid of it. But but that's sort of the whole point about everything's tied together in a way. But that's what Google is doing. They're saying you know, you can't get rid of it because you don't know what it um, is. All right. I'm, t I'm torn here. Do I do I go after there is no bad search term or do we go back to quality score? I don't know. That's <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I do want to circle back on the there is no bad search term. I actually was ready to agree with you, um, depending on where you went with that. There's bad search terms. Where did I go wrong? It, well, it, 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 it's it's that we paid too much for it. I actually don't think that's that is what makes it bad. It's that we didn't match the ad correctly. So where I think the majority of the anxiety comes from is not the cost. It's that we've now s created We've in, it, we who have invested a lot of time in crafting the perfect message to go specifically after the right persona, especially if we layered in audiences, mm -hmm. 
know who we want. Um, and if we are not able to see where ads are serving and if the click-through rate is bad, the assumption is, well, we serve the ad to the wrong user or our ad is not as good as we thought it was. But because we can't tell what the query is, um, we don't know what side of the coin we fall. Um, so it's it's not that there are, it, I, I agree with you, there are no bad search terms, there are mismatched ones. It's that yeah. we didn't provide the right message for that. Okay, I can um, agree with that. <laughs> Okay. And I think fundamentally that's uh, that's the difference between the sophisticated advertiser who's actually spent time on audiences and custom yeah. audiences and has figured, and maybe you use RSAs, which give us less control over how to show the ad, but maybe you've pinned a couple of portions of it. So, um, you know, you really, you've really thought about this versus the smaller advertiser who's just concerned about, I got a thousand bucks. I don't want to waste a penny of this on something that's not converting. Um, and I think that's the difference. I do want to go back to... John Ho's question, yes, um, and so so happy to, to, to see you here. Um, I don't think it's worth auditing quality score in 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 search campaigns. I've I've that's kind of my manifesto is don't focus on quality score, focus on quality and look at impression share, look at your conversion rate, look at your click through rate, like look at all the other parts that quality score can maybe uh, clue you in on. Um, it, it well, really that's the key thing. And, and so sorry to. No, interrupt. go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we're politely interrupting here, right? <laughs> so, but what you say is really right. So, it's an auditing thing, right? Like, I think when people get so focused on quality score and improving quality score for the sake of improving quality score, that's when you go off the deep end a little bit, right? You got to focus on business metrics. And, and that's where I think, too, like when you get, get so focused on let's improve my, my ROAS. It's like, but but why? Like, how does that ROAS connect to your profitability? Is that not the thing you care about? Because you could have a better ROAS and make less profit. That and your actually, revenue is in the toilet because you're, yeah, you focus on all the wrong parts of your business or there are no margins or. Exactly. But so yeah. I would hate for us to like make a statement like, hey, well, quality score is not so important. And then Google's like, hey, whoa, whoa, nobody cares about quality score. So let's take it away. Because at the end of the day, it's still one of those things that's a bit of dial, like the, the speedometer in our car that tells us how we're doing. And I might be pretty good at gauging it based on, you know, having driven a lot, but what does the data tell me, right? So so I love still having it, peeking at it, making sure that whatever ad text optimization, keyword optimization, structural organization that I do, that those things seem to be in line with how customers are responding through positive reinforcement. And that's kind of what quality score does for me. One thing, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to add to that. So I think if you have your conversions tracked properly, you have the right targets, you have your the right keywords, then uh, what is the next level of optimization you can do? I think it's still quality score is a good is a good thing to look at because even if you are running on automated bidding, at the end of the day, it's still Google going in and setting a bid that takes you into the auction. And that bid will be higher or lower depending on the kind of quality you have. So I don't think you should prioritize it over your profits and like you you want to your business will not do well if you just keep optimizing your quality score and you let your you don't have the right uh, targets because you don't know exactly what your profit is. But I think if you have the basics right with that, then it's a good idea to look at quality score. Yeah. I want to get one point in, and then I know we probably have to wrap up soon. The thing that I am sad at Google, and to be fair, most ad platforms are taking away, is segmentation. Um, we used to have so much ability to segment data, data to see what time, by what location, what location, by conversion action. Like there was, We had so much control to be able to see exactly who our people were. And it makes me really sad that we can't do that without really jerry-rigging the system and I'll leave, I'll leave it at that and that's a perfect uh, wrap up almost right there right so we have to jerry rig the system and that tends to be tedious and that's why you might need optimizer at some point <laughs> or an in-house technology team and, and and that's kind of the reality here right is that every time google limits some of the things we get we look for solutions we're crafty people. I mean, we've been dealing with change for 20 years now in PPC, and every time we somehow figure it out. And, uh, and so, you know, I think it'll continue to be fun. I think it'll continue to be frustrating. 
at times. Um, but it's really good chatting with you and uh, kind of hearing how you think about things. Um, and thanks for explaining all of these, these complex topics in ways that people can actually understand and hopefully take away today and uh, do something useful with. So uh, we got people thanking us here. So uh, Nava, where do uh, people get a hold of you if they want to know more, if they want your help? Well, obviously you can come hang out at Hennessy Digital. Uh, we're, we're, we do SEO, we do PPC, we do social. Um, but I definitely would encourage you uh, check me out on Twitter at Nava F. Uh, check out PPC advice from my puppies, uh, HK and Freya at PPC Puppy on Instagram. Uh, and if you're going to be doing anything uh, with PubCon, uh, you can join me for PubCon Pro Day. And I, I hope to it, that everyone has a very profitable end of Q3 and a delightful Q4. And stay safe. And Stay safe. safe. Exactly. Uh, good. And Gitanjali, we find you at Optimizer. Yes. Um, you can write to the support team at Optimizer or you can reach out to me directly. Gitanjali at Optimizer.com. I don't think you're on Twitter, right? We got to change that. <laughs> I like these whole PPC puppies. Uh, how, how come I didn't know about this? We should have shown pictures of puppies next time. Because, because if you get me on my puppies, we're not going to talk about PPC. We're just going to talk about my dogs. But you know, now we have a real fight because I'm a cat person. I have Ooh. cats. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, hey, it's been a, a pleasure. Thanks both pleasure for joining. Um, and we'll be back next week. We have uh, David Satela and John Lee. John Lee from Microsoft, David Satela, the uh, founding president of the Paid Search Association. Nava and I were both board members. I know there's a lively discussion on uh, what Google's been doing with search terms. So I'm sure it's going to continue to be interesting next week on PPC Town Hall. So join us for that again. Um, subscribe. And thank you for watching. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, guys.